this is to those people who get screening that introduce you to Alabama. Um, filmmaker, um, we just call it set and offset, which you just showed in that book. Uh, this actually is the first of a series of three events that we are having today, tomorrow and the day after. Tomorrow we will be having Shah Rukh Khan Chawla's much acclaimed Kai Kai Okada. And the day after tomorrow we have a presentation on a database on the Delhi, the events of the in Delhi, Kaisa uh, Khan and Sushi Mala will be presenting. We have Devi, uh, Devi Kaur Kassar uh, who will be presenting uh, on human rights aspects of it. And there will be a conversation about this song as on Saturday. Um, this is a bit of an experiment, and that's the whole purpose of the, the lab. Um, the film that you've shown, long most of the movie, is always continuing and moved on. Uh, Abbas has, in addition to being a filmmaker, has actually been very, very interested in assembling a body of films, not just his own, but a body of films by a number of other filmmakers, who are his contemporaries, colleagues, compatriots, you might say. You know, who, who are putting together what I think he will argue is a, a potential movement, a potential capacity for filmmakers of a certain persuasion, despite, as I think he will literally point out, a huge number of internal differences in between them, uh, to do something for a certain kind of documentary cinema. And today, uh, the very first time that he is attempting um, something of a, a performative talk experiment. We shall see and, uh, and take me forward. So, yeah. Hello, hello everyone. As I collect my thoughts for this talk, uh, I take a collect moments from a protest, possibly many protests, a riot, I forgot which one, a uh, flu like virus, and uh, all memories crushed in between. But the tracing brings me back to a more juvenile memory. I can trace the exact moment that I broke. The date was February 21, 2017, which was one of those chance afternoons that I had overslept. Should I even go today? Uh, I grabbed a copy of my heavily highlighted shadow lines and took the yellow line from the horse class to Mr. Kudal. Standing in the crowded second coach, I faintly remember promising a friend who was a member of the Ramses Victory Society to film a panel for cultures of protest. I'm definitely going to miss the first one. I was not interested in any kind of uh, protest at that point. And bodies and protest at the intersections of gender and sexuality fired no synapse in my brain. Maybe Sanjay Kaak and Umar Khalid might say something about cinema rather than just talking about unveiling the state. This better be cool. There are some days or other moments that you float into that your free will takes a step back, that you shed skin, lead. You watch your own unfolding in third person. Arbab just remembers standing in front of the Ramdas canteen and hearing screams of his friends in the room next to him. Outside were a thousand angry eyes, all men in white and brown, pushing, throwing, Nor to the fear of the violence of the state, 
which is the commonest of modern fear. It is the it is a fear that comes from the knowledge that normalcy is utterly contingent, that the spaces that surround one, the streets that one inhabits, can become suddenly and without warning as hostile as a desert in a flash flood. It is this that sets apart the thousand million people who inhabit the subcontinent from the rest of the world. Not language, not food, not music. It is the special quality of loneliness that grows out of the fear of the war between oneself and one's image in the mirror. An image in the mirror. As Arbab steps out of his body, he could see himself float through an interconnected web of identities, contradicting each other, of a Muslim, of a protested student, of a man. He chose to step away from this anger and walk out, as he felt unsafe in a space usually associated with comfort, a space where he would learn and question himself. He chose to put his camera inside and save himself from these creeping, raging eyes. This moment flung him two years later when things became much worse. The government crackdown on Muslims of India had become much more totalizing. The way they dressed, the way they practiced their religion, the way they took up space, all of it was put under heavy scrutiny not only by the government, but majority of society at large. The camera picked him up again. They became an interface between him and the world, archiving, bringing forward an absolute rage to assert existence. Insides and outsides was born. I feel like in my film, I'm almost performing and not really acting into this role of seeking, a kind of vision. While both the viewer and I know that there is no such thing, what I'm seeking here is more of a need to find a truth to make sense of what is happening in the country and what is happening to the Muslim mind in the process. What essentially became of interest to me then is the process of truth seeking and its effects on the self rather than what generally conventional documentary practice would dictate as an uncovering. This film slowly, almost in retrospect, became a collection of processes for me, to flatten, for me, just like a social media feed to put in the drawer my own lived experience to that of evidence. And look at what the process of recovering truth from multiple vantage points does to an individual. <laughs> आप ये कैसे कर रहे हो आप फिर वो उसी उस पे हो कि हम दुनिया में आए तो हम अमर हैं हम मरेंगे ही नहीं आपको पता है कि आपको आईआईटी से जाना है तो उससे मूव ऑन हां हमने दिया आप फिर भी पुरानी कहानी सुनाते हो उसका मतलब आप मूव ऑन नहीं किए कमाल है क्या बात आप कर मेरी एक बुढ़ापे में आदमी अगर कोई बुढ़ा आदमी अपने बचपन और जवानी की बातें सुनाए तो उसको आप कहोगे क्या कहते हैं यार जंक मूव डान अरे भाई नहीं वही तो हिस्ट्री है नहीं हिस्ट्री नहीं वो वही चीज तो मेरा क्या मेरी मेमोरी नहीं है आईटी के अंदर Ashfaq Hussain was 22 years old. He was an electrician in Mustafa Abad who was returning home from Brampuri on the evening of February 25th. Mehtab Khan, Zakir Ahmed were coming back from Maghrib players at the nearby Farukia Masjid. All three of them were lynched by mobs during the Delhi riots of February 2020. Not one of them came back home that day. Not alive in Nale Rajab. Mehbu Wali from Harewali village in Bawana was returning from Madhya Pradesh after attending the Tablighi Jamaat Markas conference. When he returned to his village, rumors spread that he was knowingly spreading the coronavirus. A mob then took him away and brutally thrashed him in the nearby fields. He was tested negative. A mob of 15 men entered Muhammad Akhlaq's house and got furious to find meat in the fridge claiming it was beef. They took the bricks that kept their family bed level and beat him to death. When his 21-year-old son tried to intervene, they beat him unconscious too. The family had been living in the village for 70 years. They allegedly saw their neighbors in the mob. The meat in question was mutton. In Adelaide and Malera Jhon. Fazan was 23 years old when he was lying on the road, barely moving. Injured, 
and being forced to sing the national anthem during the daily riots. From the age of 10 to 11, Faizan worked as a tailor to support his family economically. The family had wanted Faizan to get married soon. His work was going well, so they got him engaged two months before his untimely death to be married on the upcoming Eid in May 2020. They got to know Faizan's fate through a viral video. Mohammad Khalil was 34 years old who lived in a village in Musri Gharari. His body was found buried five feet under the ground. There was an attempt made to, to make the body unrecognizable. Thought was spread on him to aid. Attempts to burn the cop. Two days later, a video was released on the crime accused. Truth seeking becomes a fantasy proposition in the time field. It takes a fair amount of delusion to make any emotional sense of senseless violence. Retrospectively speaking, my attempts of taking on multiple vantage points of archives, memories, news clippings, book excerpts, maps, even trying to even trying multiple eras of technologies with old and nostalgic overhead projectors, new microphones are honestly all attempts to end the grief. That if I make sense of things, I might feel less anxious on the day. My own insertion in the documentary is my way of signaling a difference of intention here. That this navigation is the story. That there is a sense of assertion in my very presence in the film. My process as it turns towards the more personal starts archiving the tangibly real. At this point, truth seeking becomes secondary to a positive feeling embedded in the process. Knowing well enough how tragic outcomes will seize these realities. For me, it became important to stop navigating. Pause and stay with a feeling that I know from my own heart as true. यहाँ पे प्रोटेस्ट में कुछ लोगों के अभी भी कर रहे हैं प्रोटेस्ट देखो कितना कर मतलब बचाने का कोई नहीं आएगा आप उम्मीद करना छोड़ खुद खड़ी हो अपने भी वो तो और आ गया औरत को इतना पावरफुल बनाओ चाहे वो दलित की बेटी हो चाहे मुझे कोई जल्दी नहीं है मैं बिरयानी की डॉक्यूमेंट्री बना लूंगा और क्या रुबीना नसीम का जन्म मानो यात्राओं के बीच ही हुआ अपने वालिद की नौकरी के चलते रुबीना दो साल से ज़्यादा एक जगह पर नहीं रही उनका परिवार और लोग ही उनके जीवन की एक मात्र स्थायी चीज़ थी और अपनी परवरिश के दौरान उन्होंने इसी में अपनी ज़िंदगी के मायने तलाश कर लिए थे ये तो बहुत ही बुरी तस्वीर है वो बहुत सारी जगहों पर रही अलग अलग तरह के लोगों के साथ यहाँ से कितने प्लांट ले जाने का प्लान है हंड्रेड तो जाएंगे उससे ज़्यादा भी हो सकती अभी कितने हैं प्लांट्स होंगे हंड्रेड छोटे बड़े सब मिला के काफ़ी हैं तो सारे ले जाने कोशिश करूँगी सब अगर एकोमोडेट हो जाएंगे तो ले जाऊँगी नहीं तो कुछ किसी को दे दूँगी जो प्लांट लवर होगा बोनजाई नहीं दूंगी मैं किसी को जो मैंने खुद बनाया ये वाला प्लांट नहीं दूंगी उसको खुद बनाया है 
शेप में लेके आए हैं सालों से पाला है तब ये शेप आया है अगर खुदा ना खास्ता कुछ हो गया इन प्लांट्स को तो फिर आपका क्या रिएक्शन होगा बुरा लगेगा जैसे तुम लोगों को चोट लगती है तुम लोग तकलीफ में होते हो वैसे बुरा लगता है वैसे प्लांट के लिए भी लगता है कोई मर जाता है तो बुरा लगता है प्लांट कोई किसी में फूल आता है तो बहुत अच्छा लगता है किसी की ग्रोथ अच्छी होती है तो देख के खुशी होती है मज़ा आता है एक औरत का इतिहास अक्सर गुम हो जाता है क्योंकि उसकी खोज नहीं की जाती और उसका वजूद होता है ठीक उसी तरह जैसे उन इतिहासों का भी वजूद होता है जो एक दिन खत्म हो जाते हैं Nasheen Khan stepped outside Jamia with her camera one fateful night. Her first entry of inquiry in her work, Land of My Dreams, was why she was the only woman in that space. She was simultaneously trying to place her own body present in a protest that was also unfolding at a breakneck pace. She was somehow able to simultaneously watch history happen and place herself within it, not at the center but part of a larger whole. There had to be a placement of the self within this larger political context because somehow this movement was not only extending out but also extending inwards, sifting through family albums and history books, giving them equal reach. Imagine if I showed you this footage and told you that this is how all Hindus are. The unifying factor being a singular emotion, guiding towards the semblance of truth, of rage wrapped around fear, fear and rage, bodies stuck in the past. Two and a half hours away, Eras Zaman was trying to piece together what happened. The aftermath of the December violence of the AMU students was noise, with thousands of mobile videos and no clear first-hand account from the students. How does one know the truth with certainty? Eras was moved to make a film in a decent manner to set the record straight. He shot his immediate surroundings, his friends, and the one who were directly affected by violence. For it was prevailed over everything else, as conveyed by the form of the piece, straight to camera, consistently letting truth speak for itself through the voices of the affected. Interestingly, the way the film is structured, apart from the events in place, also is deeply emotional, in rage and closer to its subject than a conventional documentary production. Gun ke butt se aur laaton se, to darwaze ke andar ka jo kadi tha, wo toot chuka tha aur wo kafi darwaza khulta aur band hota tha. To char panch student darwaze pe khade ho gaye aur darwaze ko khulne se bacha rahe the. लेकिन इसी बीच बाहर से एक पुलिस वाले ने कहा कि दरवाज़े पे गोली चलाओ तो हम काफ़ी डर गए कि दरवाज़े पे अगर गोली चलती है तो सीधा हमारे सीने पे या इस पर लगेगी 
और अगर हम नहीं भी खोलते हैं तो उसके करीब में खिड़की था वो खिड़की से टेयर शेल अंदर छोड़ देंगे जिसके बाद हमें दरवाज़ा खोलना ही पड़ेगा तो हमने दरवाज़ा छोड़ दिया जैसे ही हमने दरवाज़ा छोड़ा तो तकरीबन दस से बारह पुलिस वाले अंदर मतलब रूम में घुस गए वन जे जे दे जब वो उन्होंने इंट्री मतलब रूम में आया तो वो काफ़ी मतलब एग्रेसिव थे और उनके इस पर लग रहा था कि एक उनका जो इंटेंशन था कि इन्हें पीटना है और जो भी वो साथ था पूरे उन्हें ऐसे मिलने के निकालने का तो आते ही उन्होंने लाठियां चलानी शुरू कर दी सब पे उसके बाद फिर उन्होंने टॉयलेट का गेट तोड़ना इस्टार्ट कर दिया हम नौ लड़कों ने उसको सपोर्ट कर रखा था तो तोड़ नहीं पाए और कहते हैं कि इसके अंदर भी हैं और यहीं पे कैम करते हैं यहीं पे बैठ जाओ अभी निकलेंगे वहीं पे कैम कर लेते हैं बैठ जाते हैं अब हम लोग अंदर थे वहाँ पे अंदर वहाँ से कोई मदद का जरिया भी नहीं था किसी से हेल्प लेनी चाहें तो कैसे ले सकते थे ना ही कॉल कर सकते थे क्योंकि बाहर थे आवाज़ सुन लेते ग्रुप में मैंने व्हाट्सएप पे वॉइस नोट सर्कुलेट किया था उसमें हेल्प मांगी थी भाई हम लोग गेट नम, गेस्ट हाउस नंबर तीन में फंसे हुए हैं दस बारह लड़के हैं यहाँ पे पुलिस लोग दरवाज़ा तोड़ रहे हैं भाई हेल्प के लिए जल्दी से आ जाए कोई कैसे भी उन्होंने फिर से गेट तोड़ना इस्टार्ट किया और तोड़ते तोड़ते उन्होंने तोड़ दिया गेट तोड़ने के बाद फिर हम लोगों को निकाला और बहुत बुरी तरीके से पीटा मतलब एक लड़के के ऊपर चार चार पुलिस वाले थे और वो टीयर गैसेस की जो गन होती हैं उसके बट से मार रहे थे जब मेरे ऐसा लगा उनको कि बॉडी में कुछ नहीं है मुझे भी ऐसा लगा कि कुछ बचा ही नहीं है बहुत ज़्यादा मार दिया मुझे लगा कि अब जितना होने का था यहीं पर हो गया अब हम यहाँ से जाएँगे जे से जाएँ या फिर या फिर रूम जाएँ लेकिन सडनली एक पुलिस वाले ने कहा कि इन्हें थाने ले चलो मुझको बिठाते हैं फिर एक और आता है कोई उसको जीप में बिठाया और वहाँ से निकाल देते हैं डिटेन कर लेते हैं ले जाते हैं थाने फिर वहाँ पे अराउंड थर्टी मिनट ऐसे ही आधे घंटे के करीब वहाँ पे रखा उसके बाद वो मेडिकल के लिए बन्ना देवी मलखान सिंह हॉस्पिटल लाते हैं there are three levels of certainty by the end of which you reach oneness with god ilmul yaqeen is the first degree where everything depends on your knowledge this is what you read watch write ainul yaqeen is the second degree of knowledge by presence haqul yaqeen is the final stage of certainty where the moment object of certainty is identical to the one who is experiencing it knowledge is transformed into actual experience and actual experience into knowledge this is the closest to god one can be i propose that the process of making films that wrap the personal around the public are in the process of experiential knowledge making as we use the medium of film as an assembly point of our family's past the political present and the uncertain future we collapse knowledge and experience into one the nature of this emotional historicizing is taking into account our own place in that history and that reflects in the form of these connected works cinema that is closer to god what is the thread that connects these films together all of them are coming in response to pressures on our identities inflicted from outside the majority community tramples on us both socially and politically our work is simply put born out of the need to combat this shrinkage of space this work has some distinct characteristics all of them have an element of rage they aren't neutral viewpoints interested in journalistic objectivity every work is deeply curious in the twisting of history by the powers that be and at the same time is not interested in correcting this history in a direct manner every filmmaker in this tradition is using themselves as a focal point excavating their own family history or memory in a desperate attempt to inscribe whatever one can the form of the works is sourced from this space its rawness is the confidence that any frills here would destroy the message flying back to 2017 one can trace another life of a student in ramdas a kashmiri muslim student was navigating the same violence feeling doubly scared for herself and insert mountable amount of precarity and but that she carried with her for years to come as things got worse muntaha's film a siege in the air is a parallel melodies 
it positions itself at the, at the level of the interconnected web that Kashmiri Muslims inhabit in the valley, telling many stories of yearning, loss and hope, all of whom have no space in conventional media. This work too plays the dual role of being a subject unto itself, fueled by an assertive rage to, rage to exist. It repeats the image of her trying to cross a bridge over and over, a painful refrain of no escape from the horrors of the valley. एक uh, मेरी फेसबुक फ्रेंड है तो उसने मुझे मैसेज किया फेसबुक पे तो उसने एक लेटर लिखी थी अपने एक कश्मीरी दोस्त के लिए तो कहा ये वहाँ तक पहुँचा सकते हो उनके घर तक तो मुझे आइडिया आया और मैंने एक फेसबुक पे पोस्ट डाला उसमें मैंने लिखा कि अगर कोई भी कश्मीरी चाहता है कि उसके घर तक कोई मैसेज पहुँचे तो मुझे इनबॉक्स करे तो काफ़ी सारी मैसेज आई कुछ लोगों ने वॉइस नोट्स भेजे कुछ लोगों ने टेक्स्ट भेजा कुछ लोगों ने लेटर लिखी उसका फिर फ़ोटो भेजा तो इवन एक लड़का भी मिला मुझे दिल्ली में उसने कुछ पैसे दिए कहा कि मेरे घर तक पहुंचाना तो पैसे नहीं जा पा रहे थे यहाँ वहाँ तो बींग एज ए जर्नलिस्ट उसने मुझ पे भरोसा किया अगले दिन वो पैसे वो वॉइस नोट्स वो सारी मैसेजेस लेके मैं कश्मीर जब आया तो एक हफ्ता मैंने अपना कोई काम नहीं किया मैं पुलवामा घूमा कुलगाम घूमा शुपियान घूमा और श्रीनगर के कुछ कुछ एड्रेस थे और वहाँ मैं गया और वो सारी चीज़ें डिलीवर की वो सारी मैसेज डिलीवर की और अभी भी मुझे याद है कि जब एक बाप जो था वो एक लेटर पढ़ रहा था अपनी बेटी की वो दिल्ली में मुझे मिली थी तो उसने जो वो लेटर सारी पढ़ी लेटर ख़त्म की पढ़ के तो उसने रोया बहुत रोया उसने उसने मुझे अपने गले लगाया कहा कि जैसे मेरा बेटा मेरे पास आया है One mistake that can be made here is that these films can solely solely be looked at as protest films, a product of uh, solely of what is happening around us. But this collection of works is showing us that there is something much deeper at a material level of cinema's relation with the self. When the sense of self is forced to compress both out and in, past and present, uh, this moment of collapse can be seen in Mohammad Fami's Rupoosh. who was born and brought up on the Jamia campus when he realizes that connecting to his family in Pakistan would have really bad consequences for him personally due to him being a muslim man from Jamia we see him break in this stuckness this moment captured on film is a presentation of a deep vulnerability with no attempts to gain sympathy it is a sustained scream to open in your heart the wounds that are being caused by the current regime it's open for us to fix not to glare at what we are looking at here is a piece that tries to connect its parents history of partition with the current reality it is a work reflecting back on itself अभी हो रहा है कि भेजना चाहिए यार पहली चीज कि मम्मी को कैसा लगेगा जब पता चलेगा कि भाई कर रहा है दूसरी चीज वहां पे पहुंच गया वहां से जवाब नहीं आया चलो बात खत्म अभी जैसे ना से जवाब आ गया फिर आप कहते रहो ठीक है फिर फोन पे बात होगी ये होगी पुराने सारे लोग मिलेंगे वो रिश्ता जो टूट गया वो आया फिर ये भी तो लगता है ना कि मैं जिस जगह पर रहता हूँ मैं शाहीन बाग में रहता हूँ मैं पढ़ता जामिया में हूँ ठीक है यहाँ पर हम कई चीज़ें ऐसी देख चुके हैं अभी भी एल अठारह देख रखा है हमने पिछला पंद्रह दिसंबर देखा है एक साल हुए आज ठीक है तो इसके बाद लगता है कि यार वो चीज़ होती है कि फिर कनेक्शन अगर हो गया तो कहीं आपके साथ तो ऐसा कुछ हो नहीं सकता ना पिछले साल कैसे सोचा था कि लाइब्रेरी में घुस के पुलिस मारेगी हमें पुलिस वाले क्या कह रहे थे तुम पाकिस्तानी हो 
अब मैं वहां पे अपने मामा को खुद भेजू कैसे भेजूंगा मतलब तू तो, तो खुद सोच कि मतलब इंसान को क्या लगेगा A work that reflects back on itself offers itself infinitely as nothing else but work and void. Its gaze is at once an impulse that causes the work to fall apart, to return to the initial no worthness, and an ultimate gift to its constitution. A gift by which the work is freed from the tyranny of meaning as well as from the omnipresence of the subject of meaning. To let go of the hold at the very moment when it is at the most effective is to allow the work to live and to live on independently of the intended links communicating itself in itself like benny means the self is a text no more and no less a project to be built documentary is not new to the main part the process of truth seeking and experiencing is not limited to the documentary form as one would assume considering its close ties with objective while documentaries abandon the tent pole of the objective some fiction films allow real life to enter itself the meaning of these works just like the others being discussed here exist in between the story and the storyteller constantly mutating and evolving to incorporate itself within it In Kayo Kayo Color, when the camera shifts away to make way for a car passing, or lets the actors look into the sensor, or lets itself be toyed by a child, the filmmaker is asserting themselves as a presence, not an objective observer, but one that is sure of why it is where it is. The moments of unsurety are worn as badges of honor, thereby certifying the authenticity of of the intent the piece has. Charlotte wants to tell a story of a family. that he himself is related to to of the producer of the film every character is from right from and the garden every story is a recreation of atroc- atrocities felt by them directly the making of the film itself begins the act of meaning making ah! Can they hear our songs? Takes things a step further, excavating a family's lost truth and bringing it to the forefront. The form sings, soars above the oppressor, represented in the form of an army jawan, as the ground shakes in rage from the songs of Mary's community. The turning of a song lamenting drought into a powerful cry of assertion is precisely what binds the web of these works together. 
as it weaponizes personal grief as a point of entry and assertion, it builds upon itself like a self-healing cell, replicating and duplicating its DNA, shared in between the spine of all makers here. about this select body of works is that even when it's not putting the maker in the center, the mere absence of the maker becomes the point. In Camille Sayers' The Last Rehearsal, it starts its satire at the heart of a propaganda set. Camille masterfully shows an ideologue where not a single Muslim exists and constructs an alternate reality of the so-called Islamo-Jihadist agenda. The only the notion of Kamil's presence is his mocking and playful camera work, silently haunting the recesses of a repressed psyche who looks at every Muslim, especially the ones who fall in love, as manipulators. We will be one for you to become a Muslim. You will be Islam. शोएब मैं पहले ही अपना सब कुछ तुम पे निछावर कर चुकी हूँ अब तुम्हें देने के लिए मेरे पास सब कुछ नहीं है सिवाय मेरे धर्म के देखो अंकिता मैं ये सब नहीं जानता बस यही एक रास्ता है वरना तुम अपना देख लो वरना क्या देख लो तुम्हें पता है अब मैं मजबूर हूँ और तुम मेरी मजबूरी का फायदा उठाना चाहते तो मेरे पास सब रास्ता ही क्या बचा है <coughs> <coughs> हाँ तो शोएब तो ठीक है पढ़िए कलमा ला इला ला इला 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 ठीक सॉरी सर मुझसे नहीं होगा What? Cut, cut. क्या चल रहा है ये? आज लास्ट रिहर्सल है और तुमने अभी तक अपने डायलॉग याद नहीं किए और आलोक जी आप जी सर यार अब आप मौलवी के किरदार में हो हाँ तुम सर 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 माफ कीजिएगा वो पिछले सिन में पंडित बने थे और ये तिलक हटाना ठीक है ठीक है मेकअप मेकअप मैंने पहले ही कहा था इससे इससे डायलॉग याद नहीं हो रहा है सुन चुका सर डायलॉग तो याद है पर मैं बोलूंगी नहीं क्यों भाई क्या हो गया सर ये डायलॉग बोला तो मुसलमान बन जाऊंगी और मैं मुसलमान नहीं बनना चाहती क्या बकवास कर रही हो तुम नहीं सर ये डायलॉग नहीं कलमा है 
और इसे विश्वास से बोलते हैं तो मुसलमान बच जाते हैं अरे तो बेटा विश्वास के ही बोलते ना The the art industry in India is is marked by a a distinct tendency to to consolidate, a continuous process that is designed ultimately towards the cultivation of a center. It is from this side that of the intangible middle that notions of taste, value, trend, discourse, meaning and the contemporary emerge. In short, the center is the factory where definitions are manufactured. In an era where the power to construct an imagination of the nation is held almost exclusively within hands that belong to the extreme, it is perhaps even more essential that contemporary collectives recede even further into the local to ensure that pluralities endure and that the nation is a fermentation that is a yield of various nutrients instead of a single most strident one. The betrayed map of the nation, Anuj Malhotra. To knit this thread is an attempt to collectivize. It is a very selfish attempt for me to mend whatever has been breaking inside me over the past decade. Shilpi Gulati elaborates in her article, "Why can't a film made with Indian funding compete at Cannes?" The absolute lack of funding within India, forcing one to look at the West for a meaningful budget to work on films. She makes a point for filmmakers, programmers, academics, and researchers to work together to create an environment in the country for our own distribution channels that aren't reliant on the colonial gaze to exist. To add further to this, as Muslim media practitioners in India, we very well know that the avenues for production and funding are open, but only for a certain kind of gaze, even within India. The Muslim lived experience only ends ends up being a surface on which dominant and articulate ideas can float on, be it from dominant castes within India or the white man's case, and is often not able to get into the tapestry of contradictions that exist within the minority community. Moreover, many contemporary funding institutions have also also clearly been siding with the oppressor, as seen with the protest to free Palestine and and the reactions to it by world-renowned film festivals and grant institutions. This reduces our confidence further in many possible avenues in saying what we want to with our work. Where does the Indian Muslim look towards to find space and budgets to tell their stories in the way they want to tell it? The only way forward is to create our own spaces where the conversation is not dictated by sorry faces and apologetical sympathy but rather a real space of knowledge seeking and creating towards haqq ul yaqeen by coming together even finding common threads of form and practice i am attempting here to show that the reverberations shaking the landscape are not isolated towards a singular object but rather a set of feedback loops making and unmaking themselves as they reach closer to a making of our own truth now if this process of reaching close is closer to god or some unique truth never before seen in the indian cinematic landscape is not for me to decide thank you this is i mean uh, this is not only the first I mean, if you don't take the film, which obviously is connected with what you presented here, but if you look at it as the performance presentation here, this is the first time he's trying any such thing. And if it works, you said you could um, present it elsewhere. Yeah, it depends on the response, forward, which leads to a lot of questions that I think we're all very interested in about. You know, what one has been broadly described, and you're also interested in the idea of documentary. expanding documentary taking on larger newer turns newer frontiers mm. filmmakers entering new spaces doing mm. things that are that emerge from documentary cinema as it was but going into uncharted territories so there is one aspect of all this which is associated with you as a filmmaker doing this and mm. i think this is going to be connected with even when you talk to faiza her doing her database as a filmmaker mm. and in a sense so what constitutes film making you know is one thing the other which has been the, the more difficult part of it is that you speak as a muslim mm. you speak as a muslim uh, practitioner and you also speak 
as somebody who is inclined to challenging or taking on, should we say, a certain kind of silence that we have around some of the difficult aspects of that position. Mm-hmm. Um, and the further fact that we may not, even now, have a comfortable vocabulary within which to talk about it. You know, these are discompleting, complicated, difficult questions mm-hmm. for everybody. Um, yeah. It, it started with when I uh, asked her about what kind of a conversation we should be having and I put out a few thoughts because I returned to whatever texts I could find. I mean, the two that occurred to me, one of course, Mahmoud Mamdani is good Muslim, bad Muslim, um, which I think was relevant to this particular discussion. And the second one, somebody put Ariel Azuli and this question of Palestine and she talks about it. Sorry? Oh, sorry, I should speak. <laughs> um, yeah, when uh, we, we got acoustics problems, so it's starting tomorrow. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, good Muslim, bad Muslim, and and Zule um, on this question Palestine and the specific problem that seems to have arisen now on the planet around this question of being Muslim. So. Uh, the, 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 the term that you have used inside the film and you use it here as well, which is the end of history. You know, you say that this is the end of history. Uh, it, it, I mean, the, the term is, of course, very, very familiar and it is, it is connected up with the, the uh, you know, um, other concept, which is the, what do they call the two, uh, um, what the, the, the clash of civilizations. Mm-hmm sort of you know, imagination in which the specific assumption is that an idea of the West, mm. an idea of enlightenment is defined in opposition to something that it supposedly opposes, mm. right? And that something that it opposes is incapable of denied modernity. And this is no longer, you know, the kind of abstract conceptual question, but it's a specific practicing question that, that, that you might have, which is I think the way you want on the one hand, to talk about yourself, your immediate family, your mother, your father, their retirement, and mm. their 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 uh, moving mm. with very large questions right. around why people move, why people migrate, what is the kind of crisis that we are in, and so on. so the ability to actually or the, the possibility that we can actually speak of very very large concepts like the end of history, the very specific. Concepts is something that I think you know you are thinking about, and that that also relates, I think, to this question, Muslim, mm. uh, to, right now. I, I mean, I, I just wanted to sort of mention two things. One is that uh, Mahmoud Mamdani specifically suggests that whereas one of the more recent conceptions of the modern state has been democracy, mm. we must not forget that one of the one of the principles of uh, of, of, of political modernity was that it depended upon the centralized state monopolizing violence. Mm. That it is the capacity of the state to, to be the sole monopoly of violence, mm. you know, that, that, that defines the nation state. This is the, and he almost begins good Muslim, bad Muslim with it, and suggests that the presentation of the bad Muslim is in a way almost the defining feature of the modern state mm. that wants to be the sort of enlightened state defining an other to it. Mm. So these were, that this was where the kind of framework emerged. I'm very interested. I mean, it, it you know it, it does seem that as recently as maybe two decades ago, uh, discourse on the left was uncomfortable talking about say gender, mm. and and certainly uncomfortable talking about caste. But gender and caste still now have a vocabulary. There is a way by which we can discuss. But but this question, Muslim, still doesn't you know it doesn't have settled terminology, settled ways of discussing it, and it is something that renders us all very, mm. you know, I mean, it, we, we're all sort of entering a certain uncharted territory along with you. Yeah. So this was this was what my sort of framework of thinking was. Arbab uh, categorically said he wasn't going to be answering questions, <laughs> but really this was going to have to be a conversation. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll actually sort of... Uh, sort of bring it back, not at the ne- like the world level, but I'd actually bring it back to like a very specific memory where actually this, I think I started conceiving this was also in the Kerala festival. So when I saw Noshin's film uh, for the first time, I think I, I it, it's, 
it spoke to me very directly it's kind of like um i thought i was making my film in isolation and i thought that this particular experience was um like like supposedly like an like a very lonely experience and and possibly i don't know if i'll find like similar articulations like this i guess like very uh it, because of the lockdown i think i didn't imagine uh, but when when i saw noshin's film i saw like a lot of like it was almost as if we were having a conversation with our friends without even knowing each other so that i think that sense of just uh, the fact i just want to like sort of say that i am also navigating this confusion myself because mm, exactly. um it it i don't think before 2019 i was even like you know frontal with my muslim identity i don't think uh, and uh, being born and brought up in like a place like iit i wasn't really thinking about my muslimness apart from hiding it obviously like the fact that i could sort of flatten that experience matlab like you kind of kind of uh, try to do that but like i think what happened outside like in, in terms of um, the modi government and like all the subsequent uh, things that happened in 2019 kind of uh, made me question my own uh, kind of situation and uh, i thought this was somewhat of a unique experience but then the fact that it was so similar was kind of very difficult to look away from and that kind of became because every like all of the filmmakers that i've sort of talked about here are navigating in in in, a, in their own little ways what being a muslim is mm. because there is an outside perception of it and then there is also this internal navigation of a lot of things mm. so yeah i mean i i mean there is there is now uh, i mean and you've done huge work to make that possible uh, a body of work you know i mean it's it's always important and and vivan would be one such it is always important a film or make an artist does something to say that well, there are many others you know that there is a certain wider frame of practice so it's a combination of curatorial work a combination of 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 of, of, of assembling several other filmmakers in this case uh, along with yourself who are together mm. and 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 i know you have you know you have you have a network you have a a, a a collective presence and i think there's also maybe some some idea of doing things jointly that may actually be in a way much larger than the sum of their parts mm. right yeah. um there is however another question here which i i want to stay with noshin for a minute noshin will be with us tomorrow by the way right yeah. um so uh, a specific question you know which is i mean there was some debate around noshin's film i just want to read one little text by my mamdani which says such violence that is to say the violence of the state gets discussed in two basic ways mm. yeah it's in cultural terms for a pre-modern society and in theological terms for a modern society the cultural explanation always attributes political violence to the absence of modernity so he essentially suggests that whereas a good muslim can be a secular muslim and enlightened muslim and a bad muslim is a terrorist yeah islam itself is incapable of modernity Mm. is essentially his thrust you know that that islam itself has been denied the possibility as it were of modernity the noshin when she finds herself in that space where she is defined as a woman and as a muslim she is resistant to that idea she does not mm. accept this i mean she is she is acutely uncomfortable with the fact that she is becoming a muslim Mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. but i don't know sharukh who will t- talk to us tomorrow may actually not have those problems mm-hmm. i mean in other words sharukh may be more comfortable with while while speaking about his work so i'm seeing that different filmmakers would first of all take different stands on this mm-hmm. this would become a very isolated individual kind of position and there would be no consistency in the kinds of views that different filmmakers yeah. even in your group yeah. might might take on this yeah right? i think i think that's the beauty of it because i think the uh, what what's the most visible thing is the navigation and the difficulty you can see that in noshin's film that she although does not have a clear answer she doesn't mind asking the question mm. and that definitely is present in everyone's uh, kind of uh, work i think i think everyone at least the ones that i've talked about here are like on a spectrum of belief as well like i think some 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 would be openly atheist and some would be in the middle and some would but but that doesn't change this navigation mm-hmm. and that's the point the fact that you know we at least in the exterior sense have to pos- position ourselves as muslims what does that mean what does that navigation bring forward is 
I think, common amongst everyone. And it's very, very, very different. Each and every person is differently dealing with their own religion and even like the political identity of a Muslim mm-hmm. in India. So I think that is what brings like all of these things together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Mehdi Jahan, for example, the last mm-hmm. film with the song, we actually see much more than, as we said yesterday, much mm-hmm. more than Assamese rather than Muslim. Right. I mean, it would be a regional rather than a religious identity he might want to, to power out. Um, I just have one more question and then I'd like very much for us to open this up in a conversation and I'll, I'll say not necessarily questions to, to, uh, about. Um, you know, one of the things that happens, for, for example, when you are, um, I mean, let's say, for example, one of the parallels that we draw from India with outside India is making a connection with race, you know, the mm-hmm. racial race politics that, that exists, you know, so Black Lives Matter and so on. Now, uh, one of the discourses, for example, in the West that has been there is that when you're a black filmmaker, you do get certain kinds of opportunities and support and so on, on condition that you are that black filmmaker. You know, you, yeah. you, you exist and work in the manner in which you, you, you play a minority role within a certain secular enlightened imagination and are expected to, to play that role. Mm. You have yourself said that as a Muslim filmmaker, maybe it's likely that there are certain opportunities that you will get on condition that you approximate to that yeah. that, iron, that that role as it were. Now, this is something that Ariela Azule actually viscerally opposes. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, she talks about a way by which when you are part of that minority, you are expected to produce what she describes as horror. You are expected to shock. And when you do, as you do in your film, uh, produce a kind of a disarming normalcy within with your mother and your father, you know, you say, well, why is this there? I mean, why are you not looking at horror? You know, <laughs> you're Muslim, you're supposed to produce all these, these things, you're supposed to tell us gruesome aspects of it, right? Mm-hmm. Now, this must be a real practice. I mean, since you ended your thing by talking about the, the funding and other opportunities, mm-hmm. uh, I'd like to bring uh, Shaunak into the conversation, not least because Shaunak was the chairman of the jury that discovered both Arbab and Noshim um, in uh, in Kerala, and, and, and they were the first people to tell us about, about your, your, your work. Um, then would this be, a, I mean, how, how would this be navigated? You mm-hmm. know, this, this idea of being representative of something and then being expected to perform that representation. Yeah it's, really like, yeah, it's incredibly difficult because I think none of us want to be kind of like, you know, careerist uh, Muslim filmmakers <laughs> in that sense, like just uh, for, uh, because I think that's this conversation has been had like, I'm Shah or I'm bad career. don't want to be in this tag of, of essentially. But I think uh, despite that, I think these works particularly also are responding to a time uh, I don't think uh, this, uh, the, the kind of repression that the state did, um, like, you know, the first time that it happened, I think it was more of uh, a response to that as well. So I feel uh, this these films exist because of that pressure that happens. But I, I'm not arguing that we are Muslim filmmakers and we'll make films about Muslim identity. I don't think any of us would want uh like uh, that kind of uh, especially i think Noshin, if you if, we, if she comes tomorrow she she vehemently opposed that mm-hmm. even sharuk would he because i think that's collapsing everything that we've been talking about into say uh say the tag essentially and that that destroys any any nuance that we have and i think what needs to happen is to expand it or uplift it to a level where one can sort of mm-hmm. navigate the very very complex and even like um, I would say confusing ideas that exist within say our identities. Since we've unlocked this, I'd say it's it, it's important to kind of add more layers to it rather than say, okay, this is this is the flat line and this is what we have to approach it as. I think it's actually more important to dig deeper and uh, try to get um, a, a, a lot more confusions and maybe like the fights that we have within us or like amongst us. Or so yeah, open up. I mean, there would be. I have many more things to say, but uh, uh, Shonik, would you like to? So I, I think. Peza, any response? I mean, my uh, I've I've kind of steered clear of identity politics, and I've never. And I think in, in the work I've also in the uh, the database. 
uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, the, uh, there's no we in it and so um, and I feel like this is a very refreshing approach. Also I think in the documentaries that we're seeing this form of essay, essay spin. Um, so yeah, for me it was, it was very different from, from the way I've been approaching this. Um, and, and this thing that you said at the end about not wanting to just be a, a, a careerist Muslim filmmaker, I feel like that is something I've consciously kind of avoided. But I also feel like um, it, that pressure, and I think something has changed um, in the last few years, not just, not just in the form of government repression, but just in you know, the mahal around us and people we live with. Um, that I feel like there's a response mm -hmm. that one has to make to that. And I haven't formulated that yet, that, so well done. It's like a new product of the times. Not not much. Suddenly, I'm now Muslim. I think it's more of a product of the times. And I just have a curiosity. Because Muntaha was there and so was Nauchin and you were there at the Ayabar festival and right. I just couldn't get time to you know, speak to any of you in detail. But I think what was central to the films was this fear and rage that mm -hmm. you know, all of you kind of spoke about in your own very uh, individual way. And I wanted to ask you that like, making these films, how did that change or how did you address it? I think it's still uh, the rage is still there, but it's more sustained and more, less like I think it's much more as background noise. Mm -hmm. I think the the initial rage that sort of was there is kind of now simmering at at like I'm and I think I'm more strategic about it in the sense that there is no need for to kind of constantly scream out loud ki, okay this is happening so i think i think for me like uh, after many conversations with other filmmakers i think it's it's clear that this is a very long fight and this is a cultural fight not a political one i don't think a regime change is going to change anything um so i think it's it's going to take a lot of thought into what we do next or what one does next uh to kind of steer the conversation towards something i think there has to be some I mean, yeah, emotion kind of explodes uh, something, but I think now when we're collecting the pieces, I think it needs to be a little more thought out. So that's where I'm at, where I'm also kind of like this also is an attempt to kind of put thought into what what happened, like exactly. So so now I think next would be to see what how what what aspect of life do I approach with film uh, of of life do I approach or what what do what do I look at essentially. You know, the thing that really excited me about the film all this was that there's this kind of a tension between a refusal to essentialize identity, but at the same time understanding that when you're facing the onslaught of this kind of a dissolution of identity, there has to be a kind of an affirmation of the identity of the other. So it's always with this kind of a tension between the two, between a refusal to essentialize and not having a path forward. Mm -hmm. Which was very, very interesting and I felt like there were certain moments in which you sense that in Nosheen also. Uh, but I think she was stronger take on it, in terms of where she stands. And with you there was a kind of a, in the, in the film, there was a pretty really productive ambiguity there. But I was very struck by the um, invocation of the relationship between uh, knowledge and surety today, you know, and that kind of a relationship to certitude, I, 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 I'm still struggling in terms of how to situate it, mm -hmm. because if anything, the documentary process often is not about knowledge, it's the place where there's almost a disjunction between knowledge and experience, you know, and very often affect is created 
when the trains are coming. Mm. So I was a bit when you said those those three uh, afterwards, I was not a bit confused about how you are placing the film visibly because to me it felt like the film generatively militates against that kind of theorism. Mm. So I think it is. So uh, you know the three things that you said of the three kinds of certainty or the relationships between uh, knowledge and experience. Mm-hmm. It felt to me Nita, that the film sort of like militates against those kinds of because you know documentary often is at that precipice, right? Between like not experience, not knowledge, but somewhere in the middle where it's unvarnished affect tending towards aiming, right? So right. Yeah. so how like how do you like? I think I'm, I'm, I'm on the same page. I think in terms of like, I think I'm trying to collapse knowledge and experience to kind of dissipate this objectivity that exists within. I mean, I think by knowledge you mean objectivity, but I don't mean objectivity or 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 I guess I mean something else in the sense. I think I I'm on the same page with you about somewhere in the middle of all of this essentially. And I think I'm trying to make the same point that I think experience. Um, is knowledge. I mean, it's and I mean we don't have to look at fact as knowledge. I'm I'm trying to say that if that makes sense. If that doesn't, we can continue our conversation. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, the sense of if I can just like, uh-huh. like this is also a, it's not a solved question in my head at all. Right. In the sense that I have also made a film on Muslim subjects. Who also position themselves as being both very rational, secular in terms of being liberals of science, and mm-hmm. you know, are very conversant with evolution and Darwin and all of that. But in equal measure, are also very uh, religious, mm-hmm. and they don't think of this as a kind of salient bipolarity. And I kept thinking, like, what is my sort of like relationship to them, or I would say right, but in what way do I sort of like uh, draw them out? But it's not a relationship of knowledge, you know, mm. like uh, explicitly. So. It's a relationship of affect and a kind of internality that doesn't move towards knowledge. That's what you're constantly one is constantly trying in the edit. That's what one is constantly trying in the voiceover and so on. Mm. So, which is why when you say it's not knowledge, I understand what you mean is subjective knowledge. Uh, but just that the it felt like the theorization of those three things that you sort of the kind of certainty is. A word that is very loaded towards objective knowledge. That's mm-hmm. not. It, it tends more towards objective knowledge and not the subjective. Mm-hmm. I think that that possibly could be the messaging that is wrong. Ha, ah, okay. I mean, certainly that knowledge is ambiguous. Okay. <laughs> you keep doing this and keep making another step. Can I just say, but I would you say certainty of objective knowledge and same thing? Uh, no. But I think when you are dealing when the camera comes in and you have uh, and you say that you're certain of something then uh, you know it's a composite of lensing the subject and what you create mm-hmm. and there i think it tends towards some kind of because of the legacy of omniscience etc in documentary i think uh, certainty often veers towards uh, the same. my hunch is that in, in no, actually, i actually i just want to ask you this see imagine a situation where you there, where there is an objective contradiction let us say Between somebody who is a believing person on the one hand, at the same time as a person who is a modern science person, right? right. right. Now that person sees no problem with it. Right. You and I might. It's a conceptual anomaly to be both. But that person doesn't have a problem with being both. Yeah. Right. So that person is certain. Yeah. But that certainty is not substantiated by objective knowledge. No. So they do quite different things. Yeah. And you set up your shot. You are unless you are unless you are a kind of modern scientist who only working with. With truly uh, objective truths, you are insisting me to go with the certainty factor rather than the objective knowledge factor. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. That's not what I mean at all. I, I mean that obviously the non-secular and the secular are not necessarily mutually exclusive binary categories at all, and those can perfectly coexist like they do in the characters of, for instance, my film. Yeah. In as an aesthetic category, in the subset of the form that you are working in, which is documentary, uh, there are ways in which one. Communicates certainty, yes. and very often that becomes coterminous with the objective. By which I mean that the legacy of certainty in documentary practice very often has been synonymous with the objective, which is not true of the essay. To be sure, mm-hmm. that is a, it's a different sort of a legacy. Right. But for instance, like 
is the kind of camera that I was using, which is a detached camera, I'm not part of the film, etc. Very often to like what what is certain often leans into this syntactical tools that the lexicon that we have visually of the object, which is establishing short a certain kind of thing. So as an aesthetic program it often becomes uh, mm -hmm. object. Mm -hmm. But there's been sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, there's one last thing we have to move on. But there's been an explicit movement in documentary against that, hasn't there? Uh, in other words, the 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 entire history of documentary that associates with objective production of objective reality is what the last twenty years would challenge, mm -hmm. uh, and it might do so even more by the absence of some of the key markers of objectivity, such as, for example, the objective presence of a point of view. You know, through whom this scene or the objective voiceover through whom this reality is going to make sense and so on. And and, and there's been a further move, which is what I'm very interested in, all the films we're talking about, of the true and you in an argument that conversation with Andra there and kind of the protagonist, that the true protagonist or the true agent is actually the person behind the camera, the absence. There's no there's no presence on that screen, but the presence is evacuated. From the screen, so you have a, a certain kind of ambivalence on the screen, which documentary filmmakers are make, including yourself, are making it their business to, to try and capture with the recognition that when you are, you know, you as spectator are not occupying a position analogous to that of the filmmaker who is behind camera. A couple of people who is in front of the camera as well. But you did say something about that that that. that when I talk about certainty, I'm talking about Shahrukh's certainty as a filmmaker when he knows that okay, if a car comes in and I, and I have to pick up the camera and I put that in the edit, that does not take away from what I'm doing. That the certainty that I can, uh, like a kid looking into the camera, does not break the fourth wall. I'm talking about that internal certainty. I don't think I'm talking about the placement of the camera particularly because that that's where the discussion went. I think I'm talking about a very I think in that sense, why am I doing this in the first place? That's it. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, maybe in the text that I'm saying, yeah. I don't know what the technical film lexicon or grammar or, or the statement like that all. But what I found really interesting was that, I mean, also, like, as a Muslim woman who was born to people of different faiths, you always wonder, like, whether the curatorial ways will ever reach you, like whether you deserve to be archived or their own experience counts or something. I particularly like the fact that like in your film, the idea that I got was that you are the subject, you are the archive. Whatever is happening uh, does not need to be corroborated with a fact outside of the film. Mm -hmm. um, I look at this film and I go like, okay, this this uh, stage is very sure of itself, it does not need to be corroborated from facts that exist outside of it and it's simultaneously the filmmaker's subject to the archive which is very like new and kind of needed also for a lot of us to take more ownership of that process that actually uh, I this is simultaneously the making of the film and the archive that can eventually maybe Giving the option to corroborate someone else's truth or not at all. Yeah. You know, that is absolutely yeah. fabulous. Like, I think that's yeah. the thing. Very something. Something. So, we shall we find Yeah, no, just. Uh, I also make epistemic certainty, which uh, is part of the cinematic uh, this thing. But again, yeah, that's a broader question not to do with uh, the right. film itself, but. Uh, this particular thing of it, which I was a bit uh, missing, but because for me it felt like um, it's a really rich sort of thing on ambiguity mm -hmm. and you know different kinds of epistemic amb ambiguity, a lot of uh, such. But and that's a longer discussion we can have. Yeah, I think it could be tweaked. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think the messaging could be tweaked a little bit to kind of get this idea across more mm -hmm. clearly. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm just thinking uh, learning. I do think that this lecture is a very, very valuable thing. You said you did, we were doing it for the first time. But the, I mean, in a sense, it could be like a, a side lecture with an art historian or a 
but because there is a dispersing of an extremely subjective per se question and um, existential self question. I mean, many of your terms are within a kind of the framework of the existential. And then the film and the film that you show, but particularly your film, the, uh, nobody's talked in specific terms about the couple of the husband and wife who are almost sublime yeah. within this film. And uh, I think that is crucial to the, the, the interrogation that you are doing of the social situation and their strange gentle sublimity has to be in some way articulated. I mean, yeah, I think in your presentation or in our discussion, I don't know how to ask that in cinematic terms, mm -hmm. but I uh, think that that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even Manushi mentioned, I remember I read up to that, yeah, you won't find your mother again. So how yeah. will you make another film? Which is mother will something. Yeah. Like yeah. And then you when she's looking at the television and then she yeah. smiles and yeah. then she's making fun of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, then you get this gross, and then you she sort of laughs. Yeah. What did she say? I, my reaction was, I want to make another film on them. I want to know more about right. it. Right. It's really what it is. Exactly. How are they? Where are they? Who the facts are happening? I think that's that's the takeaway from uh, the fact that the specific thing she says is also actually so key because she says Acha Shabano. I don't know how to educate myself about this now. Which yeah. is fantastic when she turns around and uh, Yeah, when did these riots happen? Huh, I tell you, yeah. okay, I need to read about this and look this up. And the way I understood it was like, okay, she was busy leading her own life and now all this has happened, so she has to revisit, rethink, re understand. Yeah, and yeah exactly. And in, in such a very succinct manner, you say so much. Yeah, I think should sort of incorporate that kind of sublimity, uh, even if I'm talking about. Yeah, no, because it also matches with your sensibility when you speak about yourself. Mm. You know, you're, you're bringing yourself into a, a philosophic zone and uh, when you're speaking about how you think about the process. And uh, they are processing their life, or I don't know what is the word process. They are living their lives with a certain kind of uh, generosity. So maybe. Uh, Maybe in your talk, you bring that into your existential frame. I, I have no idea how, but it seems that they are, they are not being, uh, your discourse is not taking account of what is so crucial in your mm -hmm. Perhaps there can be some ways of doing it. Sublimity. I mean, you see the point. But I, I read it as a form of, you know, that that famous Brechtian thing about normalcy in abnormal times, or something like it. You know, uh -huh. that that you have such extraordinary time that you expect extraordinary action, uh, as it were. I mean, I I, uh, I had a I, uh, you know I, I think it was watching a film that I again in close to a conversation do not like a film called Nasir. Uh, right. You know, uh, which I really have problems with because it's a very ordinary film about this Muslim, but somehow the other you know that a very ordinary film about this Muslim is going to lead to his, you know, uh, being teacher or something, you know, at the end. You know, so, you know, I mean, you know, you know feminism has this what was known as the Bechdel test, right? right, right. You know, in, what it's called the Bechdel test in which, if I'm not wrong, that two women have to speak for a stretch of time without talking about men. You know, isn't that what it is? Basically, not referencing their life, I mean, not talking about their lives with reference to, to men. Yeah. That there are a capacity you know, to you know, actually have a conversation for an extended period of time that is not about men. In a film. You know, is unique in the cinema. And in a sense, I mean, the, the idea of the Muslim character on the screen leading to this gruesome. And I mean, it's almost like, like, like sort of, should we say, foreseen that this is what's going to happen. The moment you are a Muslim, a character named Muslim on screen, you are under threat. 
Mm. In that context, I think that the fact that the parents were just there, mm. you know, they were, you know, there was a certain idea of the normalcy or the, the everydayness of it in these bizarre circumstances, which is how yeah. I actually saw. So, like, the central thing would make sense, I guess. Sublimity also would, I guess, perhaps. But, uh, no, I'm not yeah. choosing the word sublime in relationship to each other. Mm. I'm saying this exposition of that relationship and the sublime aspect. Not that between them they were sharing sublimity, but that his take on it is just his, his mode of filming or um, all the things that is in a cinematographer, I mean, a filmmaker would do, um, rendered them sublime. Not that they had a sublimity, hmm. they were invested in the sublimity. I'm not sure. Almost eight. Uh, any other? I don't think I've ever seen anything. I was just thinking of the what you said about Nasser. Basically, to the only thing that of the films that you showed, the film that stands out is Mehdi's film in terms of how it deals with the banal or the quotidian. Because a lot of us had similar things about Nasser, where right? it feels like it mobilizes the world of the everyday, yeah. of the quotidian, and really makes us delight in the pleasures of the softness, the soft textures of everyday life, only to shock us with pure brutality yeah. at the uh, yeah. end, right? And I think in uh, some of the things you mentioned in yours, the, the everyday is excavated in the most delightful ways, you know, there's a kind of elliptical ongoingness to life, where, mm -hmm. you know, and which only cinema can give. Mm -hmm. Actually, very often literature can't give or other arts can't give, this sense of just pure banality or time that is soaked with nothingness or just you know the passage of daily time and that kind of empty time quality of somebody eating while talking on the phone and just you know like gaps and pauses and it's really 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 wonderful and in all the films you get some glimpses of that maybe except Mary so that's a different sort of a, a, a approach to things yeah, I think the song or the song. Okay, the song. Secular. Secular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very different. But yeah, we in Charleston. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I'm taking it all in here. But tomorrow we'll have lots of. I think so. <laughs> right. uh, so thank you very much. Tomorrow, uh, 6 p.m., we will show Shahrukh Khan Chawra's Ayokala. Um, and uh, then we have, uh, actually, we have a very privileged occasion with Odita Kothari, who will be joining us on, on that film. Uh, her, her presentation is going to be called Geographies of Segregation. Uh, and then Wafa Arafai, uh, who is the producer and, and editor, and who represents the community, <coughs> as, as, as Abab said. It's set in Kalupur, which we've heard so much about in your film. Yeah. Uh, so there's a connection with Kalupur, uh, which is uh, in Old City in Ahmedabad. Um, uh, it's one of the most remarkable uh, fiction films in the last decade. Yeah. Um, so, so that's tomorrow. And then you have to work with us. Okay, that's 6 o'clock. Oh, yes, so tomorrow probably 6 o'clock. Today we have 5 o'clock with another extra screening, but actually today also was 6. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank, yeah. you, thank you very much. Thank you.